your Bibles, please, and turn them to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus chapter 11, as we continue looking at the plagues of Egypt and things that are going on over there, as we are doing our study through the great book of Exodus. You know, as you think about this and imagine what some of this looks like, one of the classic uh, interpretations or illustrations of this very text is, of course, the great movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, from like, I think it's like 1954. And you know, they do a good job with this. I found myself watching this a few times as we were as getting ready for this. And you know, some of those scenes that you can kind of uh, look at there and how they portrayed that. And you see, you know, Charlton Heston as Moses and Yul Brenner as Pharaoh and doing their thing. And how they, they illustrate this is it's pretty kind of neat what they were doing, especially with what they had in like 1954 to be able to illustrate this. But you can see some of the, you know, the hand of the angels in the sky, and then you see the mist flowing through the, the various city streets of Egypt. And every time the mist would get near somebody, they, they just, they died. And it was kind of comical to see that because they always, it wasn't like an instant death. It was always they had a, a chance to get the last, you know, two or three lines out before they passed away. But, you know, there, was, there were adults that were passing away. There were children that were passing away as the death angel makes its way down and through Egypt. But they were trying to convey to the best that they possibly could the horror and the anxiety that would have certainly gripped the hearts of absolutely everybody in that country. Whether you were a Hebrew or whether you were part of the Egypts and the Gentiles, it didn't matter that there was a fear and there was an anxiety. And I think rightly so, as that whole thing is going on there. Whether or not you had the blood on the door or not, there's this anxiety, is this going to work? Is, are we going to be safe? What is this going to look like tomorrow morning when we get up? And these are all great questions. And as we think about this, there, there's a sense of me, as we look into this as the beginning of the, that story, because it's several chapters long, I don't think you're going to like this chapter. We're only going to be looking at chapter 11, but I don't know if you'll necessarily like this chapter in part, because not, not because it's boring, but because it forces us to look and understand and confront God on some levels about what God is actually like and what he does that we might be less than comfortable with. It's going to challenge our thinking. It's going to challenge the thinking of a lot of people, everybody that really comes across it, and say, well, 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 why does God look like that? Why does God act like that? Because there are those that really view God as, he's just this old grandfatherly type. He's, he's loving. He, he, he's not judgmental. He's not any of those kinds of things. And you look at a passage like this, and you're like, I'm not sure that's the right impression we're supposed to have. It wants to challenge our thinking to accept the God who is, not the God that is in of our own making. And so this passage here just become, becomes a warning for us to consider. It's kind of like those annoying, you know, this is the, the emerging the broadcast system on the radio, that, that noise that comes on, you just got to turn the radio off for like you know, 30 seconds. So it's kind of like that. He's warning Pharaoh, he's warning the Hebrews. It's doing that, but it, it serves that function. Except this one isn't just a test of the emergency broadcasting system. This really is a warning of what is coming, and something has to be done. And truly, something has to be done, because to do nothing is to die. And even when we come to the gospel, when people are confronted with the gospel, to do nothing is to die. Like, you have to receive, you, you hear the gospel, but something has to be done with the gospel. Something has to be done with the information that you receive and the challenge that you receive. Because if, it, if you get that, you hear that, you accept that, you're like, okay, I've got the news, I have it in my hands. What are you going to do with it? It forces everyone to come to a conclusion. It forces everyone to come with an answer. And not everybody chooses to follow with it. Um, and so that, that's what happens with this. And so we're, we're just looking at chapter 11, which is mercifully short, and, and I'm sure you'll appreciate that after the last several weeks of long, really going through a lot of chapters. This one's relatively short, and I think you'll appreciate that. But it's not to say what this, this, this chapter is not important to understand and think about. It is. And we do learn several things here. And part of that is that, that though God raises a heavy hand against really mankind, we still see elements of mercy that God shares with people all over the place, for those who are willing to seek it, for those who are willing to accept it. And that's important for us to realize that God does raise a heavy hand here against Egypt, but certainly we realize that God raises a heavy hand against humanity, against humankind all the time, and yet it's always tempered with God's mercy in various ways and in various uh, opportunities, but it's always tempered with mercy. And you have a responsibility to seek it and accept it. Not everybody does. So that's what we're going to look at this morning as we do this. This passage breaks up actually very cleanly into three uh, movements that are actually kind of time-based. But And uh, uh, the, the three movements, the strategic movements we're going to go through is God's strategic sovereignty displayed, 
God's severe judgment declared, and God's secret plan decreed. Sorry, Jeanette, I know you're going to want those in the back, and it didn't make it, so uh, you're going to have to do the best you can. But here's the first one for you. I'll give you a second to write it down. But as you think about this, God's strategic sovereignty is displayed. And to be able to do that, we're going to look at just the first three verses as we get started this morning here. So join with me, Exodus chapter 11, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will drive you away from Completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people, that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold and jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the, hand, in the land of Egypt, and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. And we'll stop there. There's, there's an element here of just there's promises that are being made and really kept in this moment in time. The first thing I think you'll realize is that if we were to read this whole chapter, we would start realizing there's, 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 a, there's a chronology problem, or at least a chronology question that starts cropping up here because you know, God is talking to Moses. Next thing you know, you're, we, he's talking to Pharaoh, and he's in the palace again, and then it's like he's out of there again. But we don't have this, this nice linear flow that we've been accustomed to, and it makes us kind of scratch our heads a little bit. This chapter has some unique functions, and what we've actually done is gone back in time. We're having almost a flashback of things that took place before Moses actually went into the throne room in chapter 10, verse 24. And if you remember that passage, which is just last week, we, we were there, and Moses had gone into Pharaoh and challenged him on the darkness. He'd been called in there. But before Moses goes in there to talk about the conclusion of the ninth plague, God is already talking to Moses about what's going to happen with the tenth plague. And so to keep the chronology in our minds less than confused, it breaks it out and rips it out of the chronology so we don't get confused. But this conversation has already taken place before Moses goes in to talk to Pharaoh about the darkness that had fallen on Egypt and has been now lifted. And so that's what's going on here. So God told Moses all this before he even talked to Pharaoh at the ninth plague. So he goes in there to talk about the darkness, and God's already informed him, it's not going to work, and this is what's going to happen. You're going to tell these people, go and start collecting the, the belongings of the Egyptian people that are, are around them, uh, even as he's going there to talk about darkness. It's not going to work. But now you know, and this is, we're coming to the end. And this is, of course, the final plague. Everything's been building at this point. What's interesting to me is, like, Moses knew that at some point this was going to be the conclusion, but he never knew when the conclusion was going to be. Moses does not start this with turning the, the, the Nile into blood, knowing there's going to be ten plagues, this is what they are. He has no idea. Moses is, relatively speaking, guessing just as much as everybody else is about what's going to come next and what's the significance, what's the scale of these things going to be. He doesn't know. And so every time Pharaoh hardens his heart or, or God hardens Pharaoh's heart, he's coming into this going, okay, well now what? What's, is there a next one? What is the next one? God's telling him this time, this is the final one. This is it. He knows. And uh, and he knows now also how the Egypt, or the Hebrews will pillage the Egyptians, as God is showing his power. And this is what's going to happen. And I'm telling you, you're going to go around here and you're going to ask for these things. And they're going to give them to you. And if you remember, God had actually told Moses that's what's going to happen a long time ago. No, excuse me. That's what God had told Abraham this was going to happen a long time ago. You know, it's easy for us to forget sometimes that we think this was just a very inconvenient and... and uh, sad state of affairs for the Egypt, for the Hebrew people because they got stuck here in Egypt and they couldn't get out. But God had actually told Abraham all this stuff was going to happen long before it did. This is all part of this plan, hundreds of years in advance. But he also told them something else. This is, this is how it's going to end. And they're going to go out there and they're going to pillage basically the Egyptians. And all they're going to have to do to do it is ask. Genesis 15, 14. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. I don't know how many of them knew that story. I don't know how many of them knew that detail, because, again, Moses is the one that's going to write this stuff down. So they certainly could have had an oral history, just history that passed down stories, family stories that are going down. Maybe they knew this part of it. Maybe they didn't. We, we don't know how much of this they knew. But it makes you wonder, like, how are slaves going to Robin Hood their way into the possessions and riches of Egypt? How is it going to happen? Because they have no weapons, they have no army, they have no, they have no, no, nothing at their disposal. And what God's telling them through Moses now is just, just ask; they'll give it to you. You can try this when you go home today. Go home, go home to your neighbor, 
I would recommend starting with a cup of sugar. I, I think it's just going to be easier that way. Get them to start saying yes to small things. And then, hey, can I have your TV? Can I have your gun collection? Can I have your car? Can I, can I have whatever, you know, like the jewelry I've been having my eye on? Like start, start with something small and simple and then work your way up. And you all, you're laughing already because you know like that's not going to happen. You might, might get the cup of sugar. But you all know, like, there's no, I'm not giving me, giving them my stuff. They're not going to give me their stuff. They, they, it's not going to happen. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to, they're going to think I'm crazy. You probably just call the cops on it. No, you can't have my stuff. But you guys are playing on equal, uh, uh, equal footing. Your neighbors. Think about the relationship that these, the Hebrews have with the Egyptians. They're not neighbors. Master, slave. That's not an equal footing. And so you can imagine what Moses is doing now. I'm telling the people, hey, go ask your neighbors for all the stuff, their the gold and their silver, their, their valuable stuff. That's really what he's talking about. It doesn't necessarily have to be jewelry. It could be any kind of ornate kind of thing. But it was, it was relatively small. It was val universally valuable. Everybody likes gold and silver. It was portable. It would be useful in the construction of the tabernacle and the temple and any number of things and trade and everything else. It, it, was, val it was great stuff to have. And it would fit, relatively speaking, in your pocket. So there's a lot of reasons why these are the great things to ask for. And yet at the same time, you're like, why on earth would they give it up? But this is what makes things different here. God has given you favor in their eyes. God's changed things. He's softened their hearts to them. There's probably an element of, of reality that it's just basically like, they just want to see you leave. And they will do anything in their power to make that possible. So, like, well, sure, here, have our stuff, just go. Get out of here. Leave. We're tired of dealing with this. Fair enough. But the people aren't hostile to them either. They, they're not like, you, you want what? You want to borrow what? And the understanding, of course, is they like, borrow, is keep. They understand that. They understand what's going on here. But you think about what Egypt is a mess and in ruins. They need absolutely everything they possibly can have. So, uh, Billy read the, the letter for the Calcutts this morning there. And you, you hear about a country like that where there's massive droughts and there's fires and there's, you know, there's, there's water damage and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, when you have all that stuff, what happens to prices at the, the grocery store? They go up. Everything gets expensive because everything becomes scarce. You need as much money as you can possibly scrounge together just to get by or to rebuild yourself or to make up for the fact that your own country is unable to provide for you in some meaningful, tangible way. You need That's Egypt. Egypt is Ecuador that, that Billy just read for us. That's exactly where they're in right now. Their infrastructure is destroyed and devastated. They don't have food for the table. They don't have the animals to, to, to replow their fields. The timing is off. They need money to go buy at very inflated prices because the demand is going to be high to be able to replace those goods and services that they no longer have, and their slaves are about to walk out the front door. The most valuable thing they have right now, the most necessary thing they have right now is their money, and God says, you go knock on the door and ask for it, and I'll give you everything your hearts desire. It's getting them twice. And they give it. That's the amazing thing. They just give it to them. The siding, the Hebrews, excuse me, the Egyptians are siding with the Hebrews even over their own king. Because the king has not had that kind of favor with them. But the Egyptian people are now sympathizing. The tables are turning into their favor. And they can see that. What else is interesting here is there's a sense of prestige that Moses now carries. He walks around through town and he's certainly the, he's been the kind of the figurehead for these signs and these wonders, these miraculous signs that have been unfolding for the last probably months at this point in time that have destroyed Egypt. And he's a bit of a celebrity. I don't think he's got his fingerprints, you know, in the, the, the sidewalk of fame down there in Cairo or anything. But, I, but it's, there's certainly an aspect like everybody knows who he is. And I think there's a respect. I don't think there's like a celebrity status like, you know, autographs or any of those kinds of things. But I think he's earned the respect of those who know they have been soundly beaten. That guy speaks with God. That guy has the ear of God. Can call down hail, can bring frogs out from the river. He can do all these kinds of things. We've never seen anyway. And our own magicians do not have the ear of God the way that this guy has with God. And at the drop of a hat, he can make all kinds of crazy stuff happen. There's respect. And 
there's a, almost a sense of reverence in this. And that's going to be important because when Israel leaves, and they're going to leave just after this, they're going to walk out the front door carrying the wealth and the riches of Israel, uh, Egypt with them. And they've been stuck there for 400 years, and there was nothing they could do to get out. And they're going to walk out, and the Egyptians aren't even going to lift a finger to stop them. It's crazy. God's done this. He's done this. He's displayed his power over and over and over again because God's fulfilling a promise that he'd given to Abraham so long before. They're going to come out at 400 years and with their wealth. In all, in all of this, we see a promise that feels like a throwaway statement. Remember that, that one in Genesis 15. You're going to walk out with their wealth. It feels like a, a throwaway statement, like not that big of a deal. They're, you know, let's be honest. The Israelites are not going to sit there and be like, wait, okay, we could leave, but I'm, I'm not going until you give me everything you own. Like I'm just saying, like you're, you're offering me freedom, right? There's, there's no more sand in my eyes, no more whip across my back. I can go where I want, do what I want. I, I don't have to be living in fear all the time. Like, if you give me that opportunity, I'm gone. Forget the money. I mean, that's, that'd be nice to have, but I don't care about that so much. I just want freedom. I just want out of here. There's no way they're sitting tight and going like, we're going to form a union and we're not going until you pay it. That's not happening. That's not happening. God could have certainly put that, 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 uh, that promise on the, oh, I forgot about that. No, don't worry about it. Just, just leave. I've made it easy for you. Just leave. Easily could have done that. And the reality is that God fulfills his promises when he says he's going to fulfill them and makes a promise to you. He's going to keep it. Even the smallest of those promises, even the most insignificant promises, even the promises that if they didn't come true wouldn't change a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. That's not how God works. When he makes a promise, any promise, he fulfills it. He keeps it. There are no insignificant details or promises to God. No corners are cut. When God says, I'm going to meet your needs, he doesn't mean, mean most of them. He doesn't mean, well, as long as you call you know, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 Eastern Standard Time, I'll be there for you. Right? He doesn't have a little sign in the window, hey, no shirt, no shoes, no service. Like, that's not how God works. He says, when, I say, when he says, I'll provide for you, he means it. When he says, I'll be there for you, he means it. It's 24-7, 365. It, it's all the time. That, that, that's the kind of God that we serve. There are no insignificant promises or things that, that can be uh, dismissed so much. When he really does mean for us to trust him. He really does mean for us to go to him. You can, in fact, trust him. And he really does mean for you to do that. Because even as small and insignificant as a promise that really was that he made to Abraham. It was kept. And kept in one of the most remarkable ways possible. All you have to do is ask. And they will generously give. So, that's in the past, right? Before seeing Pharaoh. Now Moses is in the know. But now our, mas- our passage is kind of fast-forwarding to the present time. This is the context where he's actually in Pharaoh's courtroom throne room there, talking with him and having this interaction between him. This helps understand a little bit why uh, Pharaoh is so upset when he throws him out at the end of chapter 24, like, you know, if I see your face again, I'll kill you, and then we find out here at the end, and we'll see that Moses actually walks out, and he's pretty angry and upset as well. This kind of explains some of that for us a little bit. So, as we see here, God's severe judgment declared. We're going to read verses 4 through 8. God's severe judgment declared. It says this, so Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. Not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. What Pharaoh doesn't realize is he's about to face the big boss. Right? He, he's kind of been doing that a little bit already, but even as that movie, that the Ten Commandments, dictates that, you see the death angel passing over the mist going through the things. They always talk about the death angel. We often refer to this incident as, you know, the death angel is passing over that. But when you start to read this passage, 
you start to realize the death angel might not be the best words to describe what's going on here. That's not what the text actually says. If you look at verse 4, it says that God is the one that's going to be passing through and taking out the firstborn. And just in case you think, well, maybe that's just, you know, like I'm going to send somebody. But if we drop down to chapter 12 and look at verse 12, it says much the same thing. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And that might be the clue right there, that it's God, not Moses, doing this. Right? Like Moses and Aaron have always been traditionally that go-between. They're the ones that have always been raising up their, their hands or their rod you know, at the start of the plague. This one, it's, just, it's going to start at a certain time. It's going to start at midnight. And we're going to have nothing to do with it. You're not dealing with us anymore, Pharaoh. You have to understand that. Like we've been kind of go-betweens. That's not true anymore. It's, it's you and God. This is, this is a direct conflict. This is a direct interaction that's going on here. And then it might explain to us a little bit why this takes place at midnight. That, again, doesn't feel like anything significant. We think, well, it's the start of a new day. That makes perfect sense. Except that's not how they would have seen or understood that. See, traditionally in, in these ancient cultures, really it's more of a modern reality for us that midnight is the start or the end of a day, depending on how you want to look at it. But for them, you know, the day always would have started basically dawn or dusk. Different cultures had different things. You know, the beginning of the day is the new day, or the end of the day was the, was the beginning of a, you know, the day because it started at night. Like, but it would be more like, you know, 6 o'clock or something like that. But midnight is weird because nobody had the start of their days at midnight. So why midnight? Interestingly enough, in Egyptian mythology, midnight was the time when the gods fought. Midnight was the time when the gods fought. And guess what? They're about to fight. This time, God is bringing the fight to them. It's the God of the Hebrews versus the entire Egyptian pantheon, if you will, of gods that were now fighting. And it starts at midnight. Moses and Aaron, as I said, they're just spectators. This is when it's going to happen. This is when it's going down. And they just leave. They're done. Their role and their interactions with Pharaoh at this moment in time really are finished. It's over. And that's why it says in here, really, all the gods of Egypt are being judged by this one plague. It's kind of a summation of all of them all as well, but there's a sense in which they're all kind of at play here. This is a picture of uh, Isis. She was the goddess that was supposed to watch over the children. And Pharaoh himself was always considered a god, really kind of over all the people. He was considered a god as well. And neither one of them are going to be able to do anything to stop what's about to unfold and happen in Egypt. They cannot protect anyone this particular night. And what happens will affect everyone. No one is immune from these things and from this reality. It's all going down and happening tonight. And though it's not mentioned in our passage, in our chapter, we realize that even the Hebrews themselves are not immune from this particular plague. It's going to affect them as well. They are in danger. They've not been in danger since the previous third plague. They've always been exempt. It was always kind of a demonstration of God's power. Look, I can put a, a dome, if you will, over Goshen so that none of these plagues that are affecting all you guys over here, they will not touch them whatsoever. I can protect them, keep them. And sure enough, Pharaoh even at times sent people over there to, to confirm, are they being affected by this? No, they're not. But they never had to do anything. God just did it. This time... Something has to happen. And we'll look at that as time goes on. But, you know, the fact that Pharaoh is not excluded, he's singled out here, well, that makes sense. Pharaoh's been the instigator. He certainly, even his own people are at this point like, hey, just let them go. Do something. And he refuses to do that. So it makes sense to us that Pharaoh is included in these, these signs and this, this, uh, uh, this plague. But what about the slave girl behind the mill? Now, at the end of the day, really what we have is something fancy, technical term, if you want it, of merism. So it's the, the two extremes making everything in between, in the middle. So, uh, you know, the high and the low is what, the, what he's talking about, bookends, if you will. So it's like everything in between. Everybody's included in this. But you think about that slave girl. He brings up the slave girl, probably not even a Jewish slave. But the, the, there, there's almost certainly the Egyptians had slaves from any number of groups of people. They were a warring country. They conquered everybody. They had slaves of every probably nation on earth and the known world, at least anyway. So this slave girl probably isn't even a, uh, a Hebrew in that regard. But when you think about that, it makes you wonder, why her? What has she done, and 
what does she have? Because certainly, if you could say someone would be exempt, she has not contributed to the, the ill treatment of the Hebrews. She can't do anything to prevent it. She has done nothing to cause it. She's really, relatively speaking, in the same situation as they are. Why is she under consideration for judgment as well as Pharaoh? It doesn't make any sense. It's one of the reasons why I, I, you need to be challenged with all I got. Okay, what does this say about God? What's going on here? And if she's included in this, think about what that means. That means she more than likely has a son. She's a slave girl, not a slave woman, not a wife. She's a slave girl. She's probably been used and abused by the master of her household, some Egyptian, and she's had this illegitimate child. You can imagine the abuses and that the, the household slaves would have had in that country, and, and really everywhere. Even to this day, it's not necessarily uncommon. Nobody was going to come to her age. She could alert the authorities. They don't care. Of course that happened to you. That's what they do. What did you expect? But that son is the only thing that she has in the world. In my mind's eye, I can see her caring for this son, this child, probably as a 12 or 13 year old girl, playing with him as if he was a doll. Dressing him up, caring for him, changing him, loving him, and enjoying him. It's the one pleasure and joy that she has in life. She has nothing else. She does not have a home of her own. She cannot supply her own food. She's working literally for somebody else. And if she does not do it, she gets whipped or she gets beaten or she gets abused. She has one joy in life, her son, that she did not ask for. And you realize in this moment that that child, the one singular joy in her life is also under threat because of Pharaoh. She has no power. She has no influence in the world. No one is there to defend her. She is nobody of consequence. And yet even she is not exempt from this last plague that will take the life of her precious son. And I think that presents with us, in some aspects, a big problem. Is this fair or cruel? Is this fair or cruel? See, the reality is the Hebrews themselves are not exempt. Not unless they're under the blood. This affects absolutely everybody. And I think that helps us understand something about this plague that we're meant to see. The way that it lands and affects the people the way that it does. The land that it does. Because the Passover is not simply a punishment here against the Egyptian people for enslaving the Hebrews here. It's, it's more than that. It harkens all the way back to the Garden of Eden where we realize that there is no innocent party when it comes to the things of God. There is no innocent party. Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden because of their sin. The Passover addresses the consequences of that expulsion. The rebellion. This is what it costs for a restoration. Blood has to be spilled in order to restore that relationship with God because everyone at the end of the day is guilty. Regardless of how much power or status you have in the world, it doesn't matter. Everyone is guilty. And you think, well, why only the firstborn then? I mean, if everybody's guilty and that's what you're trying to tell me, then, then why is it that Moses and all the people, they don't go in their houses, put the blood on the door to save their entire family? Why only the firstborn? That's a great question. And I think it's simply this, because uh, it's Egypt's been enslaving Israel that God told us earlier was his firstborn. Genesis 4, 22. We looked at this a long time ago, but then you shall say, talking to Moses, to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. You've been harming, you've been killing, you've been enslaving, you've been beating my firstborn son for many, many years now, decades, yea, centuries. And I'm about to return the favor. It will be your firstborn sons that will now suffer at my hand just as my son has suffered from yours. So verse 6 says, A cry will go out from Egypt, the likes of which has never been heard before. It's the, the, the difficult part with that Ten Commandments movie. You can hear the cries in the background. It usually sounds like somebody just fell off a stab or you're, ah! You know, and that's it. I'm like, mm, that doesn't do it justice. 
But what's going on here is simply this, and you can see it even in the New Testament with the Jews. It was a very common in the, the ancient Near East to be able to do this, and I think even today you can still hear it going on. It's their traditions and their cultures that do this, but when someone in a family would die, the, the, the wife, the mother of the, of the house would come out into the streets and begin wailing loudly, and it is a shrill, shrill, horrible sounding wail that goes out, but it would let everybody else in the community know tragedy has occurred. Come here, comfort me, help me, encourage me at this moment in time. It was a very common, normal thing to do, and so you would probably hear it from time to time. But this night is going to be different because as, the, as, as God now is passing over the nation of Egypt at midnight, you can imagine all these mothers running out of their homes and wailing. It's one thing to depict it as a movie does. You hear this, ah! And it's over. But think about what that's going to sound like as every house on every road, on every block, in every city, in every county, in every state, in the entire nation of Egypt. Mothers are running out, starting at midnight, and wailing in the streets. And there's nobody to comfort them because everybody else is doing the exact same thing. They're wailing, and they're shrieking, and they're crying. It would be a cacophony of horrible noise. It's awful. The shrill and the cry of that probably would have carried for blood. I would imagine that the people in Goshen really could have heard that wailing and that groaning and that weeping because their sons had died in the night in chapter 12, verse 30. says every house was affected. Something died in every house in all of Egypt. Meanwhile, in Goshen, not even a dog will bark. Now, that's the weirdest verse in this whole passage. You read it and like, wait, what? Dog crap? What's he talking about? Well, they tell me that that translation is actually the dog's tongue will not even stick out, which probably doesn't really help any. But I think it's simply this. It's a, I think it's a reference to panting there. The Hebrews will see no harm. They will be so undisturbed that not even a dog will be alert panting, growling, whatever. That's saying something. Personally, I think our dog at home has restless leg syndrome. Drives me nuts. Four in the morning, all of a sudden he gets up, he starts shaking and walking around and pawing, scratching and doing it. And he plops down like a pile of bricks. He's just <laughs> and then next thing you know, he gets up and starts shaking himself again. I'm like, oh. and it goes on sometimes for minutes. I've gotten out and I'm like, get out and close the door behind like I can't I can't sleep with you shaking it it's not overly loud I don't know what on earth disturbed him but oh it drives me nuts and it doesn't take much we know what sometimes you know a dog gets you know wrapped up or wild you know uh, wound up for whatever reason it can be extremely annoying and what you find is in in Goshen here where the, the Israelites are hanging out nothing disturbs their animals we all know it's not that hard sometimes to wake up a sleeping dog to disturb them they get all animated and do that Nothing is going on over there. Not, the dogs aren't even waking up. They're not being disturbed. They're sleeping. They're resting. They're doing their thing. We see there's so many mercies though that are being displayed here, even as this is going on, even against the Egyptians who have certainly sinned in their capacity. Because at death at midnight, what did that mean? It means that they were dying in their sleep. Everybody's asleep. This was not some awful, agonizing, horrific kind of a death that would drag on for hours, days, or whatever else. It was just gone. It's a mercy. God could have tortured them. He could have made them die in agony, gasping for breath, or doing whatever. He doesn't do that at all. He just allows them to just pass away in their sleep. It is a mercy. I think that's part of it. But beyond that is that there's a warning that some might be spared. Some might be spared. Some Egyptians do go into the wilderness with the Hebrews. They seem to have believed. They've been convinced by the God of Yahweh. Even that, that movie, The Ten Commandments, I've referenced several times. Moses' is, you know, supposed adopted mother, you know, comes running into and, and running into Moses' home. She's trying to escape what's going on there along with some of her troops. She's afraid of what's going on there, so she escapes. Can I spend this time with you? Can I be here with during the Passover? Of course, he welcomes her in. Some of that might have happened, but there's a warning that some of those Egyptians might have just seen everything that was going on and thought, uh, well, we've seen the last nine, and they were all pretty bad in exactly what he said. Let's just do what they're doing. Certainly, they could have done that. 
would it, would it be a saving faith? Like, like I'm going to follow God from this moment on? Probably not. But there's also, like, I'm believing the words of God that Moses has said to me. I'll put the blood on the door. I'll do what is ever, whatever is necessary to do this. It's a way of escape. And it's a way of escape that's still available today. You think about who those Egyptians were crying to as they're going out into their, the streets and wailing. That, of course, they're trying to draw attention to their pain and their agony. But they wanted their gods to pay attention as well. But there's no one to hear them. Again, that Ten Commandments movie, as, as uh, Pharaoh's wife comes and brings to them his now deceased son and hands him to Pharaoh, he takes his son, and uh, there's some random god over there in the corner, and he lays his son in the hands of his god and says, Is there any way, can you raise him from the dead? And he's pleading with his god, Bring me back my son. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. He's gone. The reality is their gods can't hear them. Their gods have been defeated. But the Israelites have been crying to their God for years. And he's heard their cries. And he's acting now on their behalf. And we realize that we too can cry to our God. And we will be heard. Now, how long will we cry? And how will the answer? We don't know. Like I said, the Hebrews were crying for years before God was working and doing things. But God, in the background, was motioning things and causing things to happen. Moses was placed in that water. Moses was educated in the palace of Egypt. Moses was put out into the desert areas. Like God was working and doing things. They didn't see that. They didn't know what was going on. But the reality is that we can now cry to God as well, knowing that we will be heard. And in Christ we realize that happens because God's firstborn son was forsaken so that we never would be. That firstborn son was always supposed to be the special one. He was supposed to be the one who was get the lion's share of the inheritance. He was going to be the one that would inherit the father's business and, and those, those aspects of that. He was supposed to be the most blessed one. And if a family cannot protect the eldest son, they have no chance of protecting anybody else in that family. He was supposed to get the blessing curse. He got the most, not the least. And that's what God's Son did for us too. He forsook His blessing and took on our curse so that we could have His blessing. It's a divine reversal. God loves those. He loves to take the normal way of things and say, okay, I know this is the way it's supposed to go, but I'm going to do this. And it's exactly what he does. Jesus is my beloved son, my firstborn son. He's supposed to get the inheritance. He's supposed to get the lion's share. He's supposed to get all the blessings. And he takes them off of Christ and he gives them to us. He's supposed to be the special one. So I think that explains, I think, a lot of this passage as a past and as a present. But there's also a very short but simple future aspect to it as well. And that's this idea of this God's secret decree, which is not really all that secret, but... Over and over again, God has told this, has said this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Even as Moses is delivering this terrible news, he knows he's going to be unmoved by it. But this plague is going to happen, and it's going to be awful. So we've gone to the future. God has always said as much. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill the son. I'm going to take that. He's told him that before Moses even ever got into Egypt in the first place. And he will truly devastate not only Pharaoh, but Egypt as well. That's what this has always been leading towards. Does that make God a bully? Not at all. Remember, we've talked about many times that, that God is punishing Egypt and God is punishing Pharaoh for their decisions and their choices and their cruelty to his people for, that's taken place for years. There is no innocent party on earth. There never has been. The Hebrews are only spared because a lamb will take the place of the members of their family. That lamb becomes marked for death. That lamb becomes the substitutionary atonement for that family. And that's exactly what Christ does for us. That's why the New Testament talks about him as the spotless, sinless lamb of God. 
That lamb, is, is, his blood is spilled on that cross for us on our behalf. That's a substitute. God's curse will fall on Egypt the same way God's curse fell on Christ. So that you and they would be exempt because of the blood of the lamb. Not because we weren't deserving. Because we are. And you realize the blood on the door isn't what keeping that God out of that house. We talked about this actually in February a little bit if we're going through our, our statement of faith. And it's not like, you know, blood on the door. We think, well, that's like garlic to a vampire. You know, keeps him away or something like that. Like, stays away. That's not how it worked. The blood on the door was actually for the benefit of the family inside. I could see the blood on the door and see that they were under the blood and reminded them that anyone under the blood is no longer under threat. And in Christ, we need that constant reminder too. I am no longer under the threat of the curse. Jesus paid it all. It's a beautiful statement, and we often forget that reality. But Jesus truly paid it all. And, and we don't have to fear that anymore. And the people that were in their homes, although I'm sure they were wracked with fear and anxiety, and I can't say I blame them, but every time they could go, they could look at the blood on the door and realize we have followed and done what God has said. Not bought anything, we've not earned anything, but there's the blood on the door, and God says, when I see the blood shed for you, I'm going to pass over. And we see and recognize the blood of Christ shed on that cross, when we come before Jesus and we say, yes, I need that, I'm in desperate need for that blood, there's, a, there's an, in a sense, a bit of that blood put on our hearts, cleansing us from our sins recognizing Christ died on our behalf. Christ's wrath has already been poured out on Christ. So when it looks at us, he's going to pass over. God kept such a simple promise of treasure made to Abraham long before Abraham knew any of the, the names of his uh, children, let alone the nation that would become. And he kept it. God is a powerful judge, though. God is a powerful judge, but he keeps his promises. And even in his judgment, it's always tempered with mercy. He provided a way of escape. He provided a way that things could change and actually be different than what they, would, they were in that moment. So here we see that all coming together. Judgment is decreed. So is mercy. I would plead with you, if there is anyone in this room, that does not yet know Christ as their Savior, you would make today the day that the blood be applied to you. That Jesus would see that, that God would see that and pass over that and be willing. You realize and recognize that the wrath of God has been placed on Christ and He died in your place. Not everybody, you know, just because you, you know facts, you can state facts and figures, it does not mean that there's belief there. That does not mean that there's trust there. You know stuff. Great. It's where it always starts, knowledge and information. But when does it become real for you? When does it become realizing that, like, yeah, I need this. I need to trust Christ truly as my Savior. Not just to know facts and figures, but truly allow Him. He becomes my King. I think there's a lot of people that go through life that know facts and figures and information, but they've never really made Jesus their King. And that's what needs to happen. And so I would just leave you with Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I don't know of any other verses that might more describe Pharaoh than these. He knew the truth and he was challenged by the truth and yet his heart remained hard. Come to Jesus. Accept the mercy that came at great cost so that God's wrath be spared from you. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we do thank you for this day that we can come before and just spend some time again in your word and enjoy what you have for us to look at this story hopefully with some fresh eyes as we understand a little bit more of what makes up the Passover itself. And the symbolism and the pictures that are being depicted there for us 
and Lord, that is taken up so much in the New Testament to help us understand this. That this lamb, that we're just beginning to hint at a little bit here, but that this lamb's life was substituted for the lives of members of that family. That your wrath would pass over these various homes. To realize, Lord, that promise is still there for us. That the shed blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, shed His blood on the cross at Calvary. So that for all those who believe, for all those who make Jesus their King, all those who have the blood of the Lamb on the door of our hearts, Lord, You promise to pass over that we need not fear. Lord, it's such a beautiful picture. And one that I think we so easily become so accustomed to. That we forget the part that it plays in the old, old story. And so, Lord, as we come now to this place, knowing that, one, you are a God who keeps his promises, even the most subtle and seemingly insignificant ones. But, Lord, if you keep those promises... How much more are you going to keep the bigger ones? The ones that not only include a salvation, but a promise to judge the world. And so, Lord, I pray that if anyone in this room does not know you as their Savior, that you would convict them this day, and not allow them to let walk out those doors without finding that assurance of salvation. Lord, that they might know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they've truly been born again. And so we thank you, Lord, for your grace and goodness to us. In Christ's name.